Hey church family, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Billy Joe Krause, a part of the Women's Connection team, and I'm excited for us to worship and pursue God's presence together today. Whether you've been coming for a while or today's your first visit, on campus or online, we're so glad that you're joining us. If you're a visitor, we would love to connect with you and help you find community. For all of our in-person guests, we have connect cards in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out the card and bring it to the info center in the lobby for a welcome gift after the service. Our info center volunteers are also available to help anyone with questions or ways to connect with our community. If you're our guest watching online, visit the helpful connection links below this video. We'd love to hear from you. At Cornerstone, we believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Whether it be a request or praise report, we want to come alongside you in speaking directly with God. If you want to pray with the whole church family, we have whiteboards in the hallway where you can write out your prayers. If you need someone to pray over you today, there's a dedicated prayer room with volunteers available to hear your story. Even if you're online, we have a pastor waiting to pray with you in real time or reach out on our website link below. No matter how you share your need, your prayer request will be specifically prayed for and handled confidentially. We believe that another way we worship God is by giving back a portion of what He has so generously given to us. Your financial support allows our church to better serve God and serve others both here in our local community and throughout the world. If you're new or visiting, your gift to us is you being here today. But if you call Cornerstone your church home and have come prepared to give, we have several opportunities for you to give as shown on the screen. We can't thank you enough for your faithful giving. As you can see, God is doing awesome things here at Cornerstone. We'd love for you to jump in and be a part of it. Worship is going to begin soon, so take a few seconds to focus your attention on the Lord. Thanks again for being with us today. Hi, church. I don't know about you, but relationships sometimes can be challenging. It's really helped me to understand the way we're wired. And so I'd like to invite you to join me on Wednesday nights, starting January 17th, where we spend some time learning about the way people think, how it affects their reactions, the way they communicate, and we're going to learn about people so we can have better relationships and really appreciate the way God made them. We'll see you then. All right. Good morning, church. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> Excited that y'all are here. I'm excited for Jenny's class on understanding personality types, how we can better relate to each other. Uh, and that's going to be starting next Wednesday night, the 17th, uh, because this coming Wednesday night is the middle of our prayer stations as we're jumping into our prayer series this weekend. And uh, my wife and I we were in service last night and uh, it was it was incredible. And, and this morning at the nine o'clock, I heard God was moving and and I trust that he's got more work to do at the 11. So I'm excited that you guys are here. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Brandon Vyth. I'm the discipleship young adult pastor. Um, but guys, if you have never been here before, um, we're excited that you're here. If you could grab the connect card in the seat back in front of you, fill that out, stop by the info desk in the lobby. We'd love to meet you, uh, learn more about you. But we're just excited that you're here, whether you're watching online or you're up in the loft, we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, you know, as we're jumping into 2024, we think about, um, you know, maybe some of us are looking at losing more weight um, after three kids. I, I think the last three years, my, my New Year's resolution has always been to lose more weight, um, but it never works. And some of us may want to be more financially free, um, but frankly, all of those things are in, insignificant compared to our relationship with Jesus. What does it profit a man if he gains the entire world but loses his soul? So the fact that we're starting this year off with prayer, uh, Pastor Chris is kicking this off with a, a powerful word from the Lord and I'm excited for it. Uh, but if you haven't 
been jumping into things, I encourage you, you still can. There's an insert in your bulletin that has all the details on the prayer series. Uh, there's a sign up table out by the, the Africa wall with details on our 24 hours of prayer event. We're gonna have prayer stations all this week, every night this week from seven to 9 p.m. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, an incredible young woman I get to work with, her name's Hannah Vorse. And just, this is just one of the prayer stations you could come and kind of interact with. But she painted a 12 foot wide by eight foot high world map that will be in Fireside Chapel. And what you do is as you come in, you're gonna have a list of different countries and different prayer focuses for those countries. And you're gonna write your name down and pick a country and you're gonna pin it up on the world map. So as the week goes on, we're gonna be praying for all these different countries around the world that his name would be known around the world. That's just one of the several prayer stations we have going on. So I encourage you guys to participate in that. But the other pieces are our prayer texts, which every day at 6, 18 p.m., if you've signed up for those, um, they have been awesome. If not, you can still jump in. You've only missed the first few days, that's fine. But last night we got our prayer text in the middle of church. So we started the service by doing that prayer challenge and last night's prayer challenge was based in Luke 8. And Luke 8 verses 43 to 48, it says, and there was a woman who had, who had had discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him, Jesus, and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceived that power had gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. And that word peace means wholeness or completeness. So that prayer text last night said to read that passage and then pray for areas of your life that need healing, whether physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And frankly, there's really no better way to start 2024 than with prayer. Nothing of eternal significance happens, from, happens apart from prayer. Uh, so let's pray together now for that healing that we all need. Uh, and then we're gonna worship together. Father, I praise you and I thank you so much that you are a God who heals. You are the great physician. And as we see from this woman in Luke 8, just a brush against your presence can heal. And Lord, some of us are carrying stress and anxiety and depression into this year and we need that we need that mental healing that freedom some of us are harboring bitterness and resentment and hatred and we need some emotional healing and lord we do pray boldly for physical healing over anybody that needs it. But Lord, the most significant thing that you've ever done, the only thing that matters, everything else fails in comparison is that you bring us complete and true spiritual healing and new life through Christ. But Lord, some of us need to surrender more deeply. Some of us need to recommit. Some of us need greater conviction. Some of us need to lean into your spirit more. So Lord, bring spiritual healing. And we know that you are faithful to answer these prayers we know that you are a gracious and loving God and you wanna bless us. So Lord, you deserve every ounce of the glory and praise and worship that we have to offer you. So as we worship you now, let us remember that you are a God who heals, you're a God who answers prayer. So we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand together and worship.
faithfulness we just continue to worship you this morning because you are worthy we just put all our focus on you Never fail. 
we recognize your goodness and your mercy. God, we thank you for your faithfulness that you are steady, that there's nothing that this world can give us that can satisfy. You are the only one that satisfies. Thank you, Jesus. And we just run to you, Father God. We run to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's so awesome to worship with you this morning. Man, I love to hear your voices sing. And you know what? The Lord loves to hear you sing his praises. He loves it. It's just such a sweet, sweet perfume incense to his ears. When we lift our voice and our heart, it's just wanting to just bless him. Man, he just loves that. And I love to hear that too. It just makes my heart just sore when I hear you guys sing to the Lord. So can we just give him praise? God, you are worthy of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Would you turn to someone next to you and just tell him good morning and that say he's worthy of praise. You can be seated. Good morning, Cornerstone. Hey, I, I'm, I'm going to echo, Beck, echo Becca's words. That, that was good worshiping with you in uh, first service in 2024. Praise God. Hey, before we get started, I just want to let you know that after Christmas, Pastor Don had his hip replaced, and uh, surgery went well. He's home recuperating. I don't know if he's following doctor's orders, but I know he's following Barb's, so he's in good hands. But anyways... Uh, Keep him in prayer, would you? Um, we'll, we'll wish him a speedy recovery. How many of you can believe it's 2024? Where did 2023 go? Man, it time just flies by, doesn't it? Okay, I've been doing a survey every service. How many of you have made New Year's resolutions heading into 2024? Okay. How many of you are going to lose weight? Okay, we got a few honest people out there. Okay, how many of you, uh, uh, you got your new 365-day devotionals and you haven't missed one yet? How many of you got your new gym memberships? All right. Um, how many of you know by the middle of February all those resolutions go out the window? Yeah, that's the way it works for me too. Well, today we're beginning a three-week series on prayer. And, and I pray what I share with you today and what we will learn in the next few weeks last longer than most of our New Year's resolutions. When I was asked to uh, speak on the subject of prayer, I, I'd already sensed the Lord speaking to me about the practice of prayer in my personal life. So instead of committing to a New Year's resolution in 2024, I sensed the urging to commit to a revolution in 2024. Because you know there's quite a difference. 
You see, a resolution is a, is a firm decision to do or not to do something. But Webster defines a revolution as a sudden, a radical, a complete change or a fundamental change in the way of thinking about or visualizing something. It's a change of paradigm. So what I will share with you today is an extension of what the Lord has laid on my heart. And I hope that you're challenged the same way that I've been challenged, individually and collectively as a church, considering the time in human history that God has strategically placed us now. And this message is a call to prayer. And that's whether it's a prayer of intercession where we plead with God on behalf of, of others or a prayer of petition where we focus on our personal needs. Regardless, it's time to pray. And our intention is to seek God's mercy, God's guidance, God's provision, and God's protection, believing that he hears and that he responds to the heartfelt requests of his people. And so I, I, I pray that some of you will sense the urgency the necessity and the privilege and the honor to pray for the God of all creation to come to the rescue and show himself strong on our behalf. You know, as I looked at my spiritual life and practices, I concluded, I don't pray often enough. I don't pray long enough. I don't pray precisely enough. I don't pray intensely enough and I don't pray persistently enough. But other than that, I was doing pretty good. So the takeaway from all this is, is what I've been doing presently with regard to my prayer life, it is insufficient to face the challenges I will encounter as an individual, as a pastor, and what we will be coming up against collectively as a church. Something needs to change, and that something includes me. Why is this so important now? Well, if we step outside of our world in Murraysville and Delmont and even Cornerstone, where things are going pretty well, you might notice that the state of the world and the culture are full of chaos, confusion, wickedness, and evil. And alarms and warnings should be going off in the hearts and minds of observant believers everywhere. You see, what's taking place in the church, what's taking place in politics and academia and economics, it's not sustainable unless God intervenes. And I believe the psalmist felt this same sense of urgency when he wrote Psalms 119, 126. Look what he said. He said, it's time for the Lord to act. Well, they've broken your law. Now, if we're honest, if we consider the state of the church, it's essentially powerless in many ways. Its influence in shaping the culture is negligent or minimal at best. Once great denominations they reject biblical authority or they preach a watered down gospel hoping to make it more palatable to the modern culture and they do so without understanding why they have no power. Instead of sound teaching and doctrine, motivational speaking, wokeism and the gospel of self-help have replaced the authority of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. And in their deception they wrongly believe that their enlightened understanding will appeal to the masses and bring them back to the church and bring peace to the chaos these ideologies started in the first place. And then this one. Contemporary churches and pastors have unhitched themselves from the Old Testament and they do so in hopes of remaining relevant to the popular culture, ignoring the fact that Jesus clearly tells us in John 5, 6, for if you believed in Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote about me. And then we forget that we're told to come out of the world and be separate, forgetting that holiness has everything to do with separateness from the world system and the world ways of thinking, not play in it. This, this double-mindedness, it's, it's soundly condemned in the book of James which tells us you can't walk with one foot in, in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. This creates lukewarmness. It's not a commendable trait. And we are told, as the church of Laodicea, not good. Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. And then consider the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, the people from whom our Messiah came and will come again, praise God. It's currently surrounded by hostile enemies and nations. Enemies that want them eliminated, annihilated, and removed from the face of the earth. 
But in their demonic zeal, they seemed to forget these previous attempts at destruction of the Jews. It didn't work with Pharaoh. It didn't work with Haman. It didn't work with Hitler. And it won't work with Hamas and Hezbollah. Why? Because God is faithful to the covenant promises that he makes with his people. Amen? And if, yeah, amen. And if he's not faithful to them, then why in the world would we think he'd be faithful to us? But that's not the case. He is. Then look at our once great academic institutions. Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. These, these origins of these schools are of the gospel. Did you know that? Did, they used to, did you know they used to train ministers and clergy? Well, they've been totally secularized. How pathetic. College campuses, they have become breeding grounds for anti-Semitism. Our public school systems have banned prayer from the classrooms and they seek to propagandize our children in the ways of humanism and secular ideologies. And our great government institutions, the White House, the Congress, and the Supreme Court, they're dominated by secular and liberal thinking. How many of you think it's time for God to act? How many of you think it's time for God to move? <clears throat> What's gonna cause him to move? What's the answer? Where's it gonna come from? Well, what's our Christian response gonna be? Where's the power gonna come from? Is it gonna be more church programs, barbecues, spaghetti dinners? Mm -mm. Is it better marketing on social media? Mm -mm. Is it a more effective social and political strategy? I don't think so. I read a book 30 years ago by a guy named Ian Bounds and for the third service in a row, I forgot the name of the book, but I remembered the quote, okay? He says the church looks for better men. I'm sorry, better methods, but God looks for better men. Let that sink in a little bit, folks. Okay, that's a, that, that is a powerful truth. That's a powerful truth. And here's why. You see, the natural methods and plans of men may bring about some change. They may have some value in giving symptom relief in, in some situation, but the best and most brilliant efforts of men can easily miss methods God has chosen for his will to be done. And I'm gonna give you a biblical example highlighting a tremendous contrast. King Asa was a king who reigned in Judah for 41 years, some 900 years before Jesus. And he, he was a fantastic king. He was known as one who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he, he lived at a time in Israel when Israel was godless without a teaching preach, without the laws of God. The land had no peace in the people suffered much, much affliction. Well, Asa hears a prophetic word from a prophet whose name was Ezariah in 2 Chronicles 15 two. And here's what Ezariah says to him. He said, the Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Well, when Asa hears these prophetic words, he jumps into action. He starts removing all the idols from Judah and Benjamin and the surrounding cities. He, he restores the altar of, of the Lord and, and the worship of the one true God. He got the people to enter into a covenant to seek the Lord with their whole hearts. And as a result, the Lord brought peace, rest, prosperity, and favor to that nation. Well, a million man army of Ethiopians decides to do battle with Judah. And Judah was outnumbered two to one. So, Ace is no dummy. We're toast, unless God intervenes here. He starts crying out to God, and God hears his cry for help. And the Ethiopian army is totally defeated, wiped out, and plundered. And God's name is exalted, and Asa and Judah prosper as a result. That's good. Well, in the 36th year, of Asa's reign. King Basha of the northern kingdom of Israel wasn't happy with what was happening in Judah. You see, when the people of his kingdom heard about the Lord's favor and the Lord's blessing in Judah, they were moving to, from the northern kingdom down to Judah. Just like Californians are moving to Arizona and New Yorkers are moving to Florida. It's the same deal, okay? King Basha wasn't happy about all his taxpayers leaving his country either. So he decides to set up some blockades to prevent his citizens from emigrating to Judah. Well, King Asa comes up with a brilliant political solution. He makes a treaty 
and, and he signs a deal with the king of Aram to remove the king of Basha from his blockades for some silver and gold that Asa got from the treasury and some of his own stash. Well, King Asa's plan worked. Basha was removed from the blockades without any bloodshed from Asa's people and at a minimal cost. So I envision King Asa sitting in the boardroom with his advisors, smoking cigars, feet up on the desk, patting each other on the back. Now, I just made that part up, but you get what I'm trying to say here, okay? Yeah, so while they're in there, you know, giving each other high fives, this prophet walks into the room. It's prophet Hananiah, and he goes, you have acted foolishly because you relied on the king of Aram instead of the Lord. You could have had the king of Aram's army in your hands. And, he, and you can imagine what Asa felt being rebuked publicly like that. And then, then Hanani reminds Asa of how he had forgotten about the victory that God gave him over the Ethiopians. And he spoke these words to Asa from 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Look what he says. He said, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Asa's mistake was he failed to make prayer his first move, as he did with the Ethiopians. Instead, he trusted in his success, his status, his political and his negotiating skills, without first seeking God's will and trusting in him. So what can we learn from this story? Well, number one, we need to seek God first, period. Whether it's in good times or bad times, we need to seek God first. Wherever he has strategically placed you at this moment in time, whether it's education, whether it's medicine, law, ministry, plumbing, or politics, God has to be your first go-to guy. That's always your first move. And then don't rely on self. That is your, your status, your cleverness, your, your networking and your marketing skills, your degrees, your past accomplishment, your oratory skills or your eloquent speech, speech to make things happen. You see, all that stuff is secondary to God leading and working through you. And then number three, realize this. God is not impressed with the ways and the methods of men, but he honors and he blesses people who seek first after him. Amen. So when the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro, this congregation today, looking for someone to whom he can show himself strong, what will he find when his eyes hit your seat? Will he find someone who believes in him, in his power and his promises, and demonstrates it by spending time on their knees seeking his will and his ways? I hope so. Will he find a person who believes in the power of the gospel and whose faith is strengthened and empowered through spending time in prayer seeking after him? I believe John Wesley made an accurate quote when he said this. He said, God does nothing but in response to believing prayer. So you might ask the question, if God already knows the outcome of events and the end of history has already been written, then what is prayer gonna do if everything's been predetermined? Well, the answer is simply that prayer is God's appointed way of obtaining things. James 4.2 says this, you have not because you ask not, right? And then he says, when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little example here um, of somebody asking with the wrong motives. Um, Rich and Cece, we, were, we, we taught divorce care, we showed a DVD, they're, they're teaching it now. But uh, in one of the DVDs, they asked this guy, they said, hey, do you pray for your ex-wife? He basically, he goes, yeah, I, I pray she gets hit by a car, run over by a train and an ambulance. All right, I don't think God's gonna answer that one. What do you think? No, but prayer is a chosen mechanism through which God fulfills his will and purposes. And this is why Paul encourages us to pray at all times, Ephesians 6, 18. Pray at all times in the spirit and to pray without ceasing in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter five. Pray without ceasing. You see, whenever we turn away from God, 
And whenever we stop seeking him as a nation, as a church, or, or, or as individuals, what we end up with is what we have now. Wickedness, chaos, confusion, and evil. So what do we do when this is the case? What, what other clues, what directions, what, what instruction has God given us in his word that teaches us about petitioning the Lord in times like these? I want you to listen to what God told King Solomon after he'd built and dedicated the glorious temple to the Lord. The Lord spoke to Solomon in response to prayer, and the Lord told Solomon, if judgment were ever sent by God upon his people because they reject or neglect his laws and commands, God would relent if they would do this. You've probably heard this, Second Chronicles 7, 14. Famous passage. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Well, in this passage, God is clearly addressing the nation of Israel. But I think there are elements and principles pointing out in God's directive here that still apply to all of God's covenant people in 2024. And that includes me, and that includes you. People called by God's name are people in relationship with him, and they are identified by God's character, God's nature, and God's essence. It means that we, we are his. And if Jehovah is your God and Jesus is your Messiah, then you are one of God's people because you've been adopted into God's family. And what God was telling his people at that time was that relief from judgment would come when his redeemed, his chosen, his beloved, his called, his family would do these four things. Number one, they would humble themselves. Number two, they would pray. Number three, they would seek his face. And number four, they would turn from their wicked ways. So God says, if we would humble, pray, seek, and turn, God would hear, forgive, and heal. In other words, God says that he would respond to our actions. There are things that we can do that cause God to move. And I am sure these principles are timeless and still in effect and applicable today. Well, what do we need to do that causes God to move? Well, we need to humble ourselves. The, the Hebrew word for humble means to bend the knee. It means to be subject to, or it means to be placed under. And, and one of the components of answered prayer has to be our attitude in submitting to God's authority. God is our king and we are his subjects. So let's ask ourselves, let's be honest. Do our actions and behavior reflect a heart that's submitted to God's ways and authority? Or is it the other way around? Do God's ways bend its knee to ours? You know, humility or subjecting to God's authority is a requirement and an element of answered prayer. And then once we've bowed down to our king with an attitude of submission in our heart, mind, and behavior, we're instructed to pray. How I many of you know the prayer is a form of worship? Yeah, it is. True prayer comes from a heart of dependency on God. It's not lip service. It's not merely repeating words and phrases. Prayer is heartfelt communion with God and an attitude that seeks his will to be done in your life. Prayer is another essential element, in establishing a relationship with God and receiving his mercy, his blessing, and his healing. And Ephesians 6 tells us that prayer and the word of God are two weapons that we have at our disposal. So I say let's learn to use them Whitely, lightly, or wisely, I'm sorry. And here's the great part. Prayer doesn't require internet. It doesn't require cell phone service. It doesn't require uh, Wi-Fi. You don't have to worry about your call being dropped on the way home from church, okay? God will instantly hear you, and here's why. Because of the shed blood of Christ, we can be instantly present in the throne room of God. Because Hebrews 4.16 tells us this. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So whenever we pray, God responds. When we ask, God moves. And this is the bottom line. The prayers of God's people clearly affect how God acts. And if we were genuinely convinced that God brings about remarkable changes through our prayers, then we would pray much more than we do. And sadly, many who pray very little likely do so because they don't believe prayer accomplishes much. And then God also asks that we seek his face. 
And if you're like me, I guess most of us are pretty good at seeking God's hands. That is what he can provide for us and do to meet our needs, but that's not what's being asked of us here. God wants us to seek his face. And this expression conveys the idea of seeking in a close and an intimate relationship with God. And in the context of biblical language and imagery, the face of God represents his favor, represents his presence and the essence of who he is. So it's a calling to pursue a deeper connection with God, to desire that connection, to desire his presence and a genuine heartfelt desire to be in communion with him and to align your life with his will. Let me ask you this question. Is that a desire of yours today? Well, I can tell you, I know it's his. And it is another essential element and a secret to answered prayer. The last essential element in God's instruction here is to turn away from wickedness. It's to turn away from evil. It's to turn away from sin. You know, no matter how you slice it, I still haven't found anywhere in the scripture where God blesses disobedience. Haven't saw it yet. Um, he requires obedience to his revealed will. And his revealed will is found in his word. And he requires us to turn from or to repent from sin and disobedience. Repentance involves genuine sorrow and regret towards God because of our sin. It's a turning away from something and it involves turning towards God, seeking his forgiveness, seeking his will, and living accordingly. So if we would do these four things, if we would humble, pray, seek, and turn, God says that he will act, he will respond by hearing, forgiving, and healing. And if we hope to ever see revival on any kind of a large scale, it will begin with God's people continuing earnestly in steadfast prayer. You see, that's what sparked the first revival in Acts chapter one. Disciples devoted themselves to prayer until the Holy Spirit came and 3,000 were added to their number in one day. Great revivals always begin first in the hearts of a few men and women whom God has stirred by his spirit to believe in him as the living God who answers prayer. We can put a sign out front all day that says revival next Sunday. We can teach a class on revival in the academy. Um, that ain't gonna hack it. That's not gonna do it. There are no shortcuts to prayer. Well, I came across some other guidance and instruction in the scripture given on prayer. And it was from a prayer I've read hundreds of times. I probably said it hundreds of times, but I'd never seen it this way. I never realized just how radical it was. I never thought about how transformative it is. I never thought just how subversive it is to the established order of things. So let me tell you a little more about it. It's a prayer that, that calls for a revolution, but it's not a revolution that comes from human hands, human machines or methods. It can only be brought about by the finger of God. It's a prayer that calls for a revolution in its most radical sense. It calls for the overthrow of corrupt governments. It calls for the ousting of tyrants and dictators. It calls for the toppling of the world system and the world's ways of thinking. It calls for the destruction of the principalities and powers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. It calls for the expulsion of the God of this world and the world system he controls. It calls for the denial of self and placing a new king on the throne of your hearts. It calls for a revolution in our spirituality that transforms who we are, shapes our values, directs our behavior, and determines our destiny. It's a prayer reminding us to pray collectively together as the family of God and the body of Christ. It's a prayer reminding us to be a people who honor, value, and esteem God's holy name and demonstrate it through our actions and behavior as his representatives to a lost world. It reminds us that we are citizens of heaven. And until God's kingdom is fully established on earth, we are to pray for its complete realization, expression, and visible manifestation. It's a prayer that reminds us to align our wills with God's will. No longer my will be done, but God's will be done in and through you. It reminds us that we can never forget how totally dependent we are upon God to meet all of our daily needs. Not the government, 
not our spouse, not our employers, but always be mindful that the, the God is the ultimate meter of needs in our life and we must recognize and we need to acknowledge that daily. And then we must never forget that we are the objects of God's love, his grace, mercy, and forgiveness and we need, need to extend those actions to others. And lastly, it reminds us we need to pray for God's protection and God's temptation from evil. Well, where is this prayer in the Bible, Pastor Chris? It comes from the greatest teacher, whoever taught, the greatest preacher, whoever preached, the greatest prayer, whoever prayed, and from the giver of the greatest sermon ever given. Of course, I'm talking about the Lord Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus was explicitly asked by his disciples to teach them how to pray. This is the Lord's instruction to us. So if you don't know where to start in prayer, you don't know how to pray, let me encourage you. Let's pray this prayer, okay? And we're gonna have a little practice right now. What do you say? I don't want you to pray it from memory. I want you to pray it from right here, from your gut and from your heart. So let's go ahead and pray this together, shall we? Let him hear you. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That was beautiful, folks. Nicely done. Isn't that fun praying together? Yeah, yeah, it really is. You know, um, throughout the Bible, God gives us historical evidence and he gives us biblical proof that he answers prayers. There is a pattern of, an, of answered prayer that begins in Genesis and it continues through Revelation. And I believe that God is giving us a message through this prayer revealed in the scriptures, through this pattern revealed in the scriptures. It serves to remind us, to motivate us and encourage us that God responds to the prayers of his people. And so my job right now is to convince you that this is true and to stir you to action so allow me to give you a few reminders to motivate you and to stir you. We can start with Genesis 18, where Abraham intercedes for the righteous people of Sodom and Gomorrah that they would be spared in judgment. And God heard his prayer. Lot and his family were saved. We can go to Exodus chapter two, where the Israelites cry out to God for deliverance from Egyptian slavery and bondage. And God hears their prayer. Then we can go to, 1 Samuel chapter one, where Hannah, whose womb was barren, she prayed to God for a child and the prophet Samuel's born. We can go to 1 Kings chapter three, where young, young King Solomon asked God for wealth, uh, for wisdom, and he gives him wisdom and wealth beyond our comprehension. And then we can go to James 5, 17, where the prophet Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain. And guess what? It didn't rain for three and a half years. And we can see the prophet Elijah also praying that God would reveal himself to the prophets and the priests of Baal. And what happens? God hears his prayer and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And then we see King Hezekiah, he was on his deathbed. And he cries out to God and God hears his prayer and God extends his life by, by 15 years. We see the pro prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter nine. He's praying, confessing the sins of Israel and his own sins. And the angel Gabriel shows up and gives him a vision of the future and the, and the coming Messiah. We see Jonah, Jonah chapter two. Jonah cries out from the belly of a well and God hears him and God answers his prayer and spews him out on dry land. We see the Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15, he, she has a daughter who's demon possessed and he, she cries out to Jesus, persistently bothering him, heal my daughter and Jesus answers and she's free of demon possession. We see blind Bartimaeus cries out for mercy to God and Jesus hears his cry and he's healed of his blindness. We see Jairus who had a sick daughter, she was dead and dying and Jesus hears him and answers and he raises her from the dead. Remember Zechariah in Luke chapter one, he prayed for a son and John the Baptist is born. In Luke chapter 23, we see the repentant thief on the cross asking Jesus for mercy. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then in John chapter 11, Jesus stands before the tomb of Lazarus, weeping and praying. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of that grave. Jesus says, take off the grave clothes. And then we see Peter in prison and the church begins to pray for him. And there's a miraculous release of Peter from prison. 
In Acts chapter 16, we see Paul and Silas praying and praising God in jail. And God says an earthquake, and there's a jailbreak, and they're freed. And then we see Tabitha, she's dead. Peter's summoned, he stands before the body of Tabitha, and he prays, and he says, Tabitha, arise. And Tabitha arises from the dead. How many of you think God might answer prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely he does. Did you know that the 24 elders around the throne of God have the prayers of the saints contained in golden bowls that go up as incense before the Lord? And so what I think we ought to do right now is we need to give those guys a little business, okay? We need to fill those golden bowls up, okay? Now, I know some of you, you need a miracle. You need a miracle. You got, you got family members going to hell, okay? You, you, you've got friends, family with cancer, okay? You, you, you have loved ones, their marriages are falling apart. So what I wanna do right now, what I wanna do right now is invite you to come up here. Suzanne and I are gonna be up here. We got, we got stuff going on too, folks. We're gonna pray and we're gonna petition that the Lord acts now. What do you say? Will you join me? So the, the worship team's gonna, gonna sing, but I wanna give you the freedom as the Holy Spirit leads you to come on up here and to pray for the things God has laid on your heart.
your children and you hear your children now you are the same god you are the same god you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same god you are the same god
So I pray today that you are moved, that you are touched, that you are filled by the Holy Spirit of grace. And I also pray that God's kingdom comes today in your life and his perfect will be done as you submit to his ways. It's God's day. In his son's name we all pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Wow. That, that was wonderful.